1997 Starship Troopers Review and Thoughts. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I absolutely loved. There will be some jokes, none at the expense of members of minorities, and I will get into some serious topics. Now, if you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies, because of that it's not that much fun to watch today, and or it's different from the source material, so it sucks. Whether you agree with those assessments or not, this is not that video. This movie can help fight the fascism on the rise right now in the West. Spreading the word about it is important. I'm doing my part. Would you like to know more? I realize it was long. I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. Now, the top link in the description box will enable you to donate to the SAG After Strikers, and I implore you to do so. The writers have won their strike, but the actors are still fighting. The And then there are some links to videos to help explain why this is such an important strike. So, I start this video with a review where I'm almost definitely not going to spoil anything. If I end up spoiling something, I'm going to verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And I think I might also spoil some stuff from the book, though. I'm going off what I've heard. I haven't read it myself. And yeah, so this movie is rated R, and it is a hard R. It really goes for, like, there's not a lot of, like, profanity and alcohol, drugs, and smoking, but, you know, and the sex nudity is moderate. The violence and gore and frightening and intense scenes are both severe, and yeah, like, if you think there's some chance that this movie might be too graphic for you, there's a pretty decent chance. Yeah, you're probably right. You know, and it, it sucks. It sucks that you can't watch this amazing movie, but it it is very very. It's it's kind of wild that it's not NC-17, honestly. Um, but it also uses it really well. The the graphic violence stands in stark contrast to like the emotional highs. The the when characters have really positive interactions with each other, and then you see someone, like, torn apart, stabbed, you know, just, yeah, it, it creates a very powerful contrast, and it, yeah, it, it works extremely well for the, the movie, which is in part warning against the horrors of war. And I have no idea how many times I've watched this movie. Um, couple dozen, probably. Uh, the first time I watched it was in the early 2000s, so not a huge, not that long after it first came out. My most recent viewing was just now, just before I hit record. In some places in the world, it is on Disney+, Plus, which is how I was able to watch it. You know, I did used to have it on VHS. I 100% wore that copy out. And, yeah, there's been some years where I didn't have access to it. Now that I do, I really wanted to make sure, you know, the stuff that's on Disney+, Plus, not all of it stays there forever. Wanted to make sure that I did this before, you know. I have also been trying to, to get it, like, get a get a physical copy, and I've... Had some trouble finding a, a place that sells. Now, uh, the, yeah, so the plot, uh, quoting from IMDb, humans in a fascist, militaristic future wage war with giant alien bugs. And, let's see, you know, th this is one of those movies I loved from the first viewing uh, of it, you know, and... The first time I decided I was going to do a video talking about this movie, at least, you know, originally I wanted to also do the, the sequels. Right now I don't have access to them. You know, if I do at some point down the line, there's a chance that I, that I will. But the, yeah, you know, I've been wanting to do a video on this for, I don't know, uh, many, many years, maybe over a decade by now. And let's see, so yeah, this movie was written by the yeah, um, 
The screenplay was written by Edward Neumeyer based on the Robert A. Heinlein R.I.P. book. And Neumeyer has done some other stuff that... Uh, let's see... Yeah, he, he wrote the original RoboCop, which, you know, that's how he and d director Paul Verhoeven, you know, they already knew that they could work together really well. And the poor guy is credited with writing characters for a bunch of later RoboCop things, which, yeah, considering that they're not up to the high standard he set with the original RoboCop, that may be frustrating for him. Wow, there's a lot of RoboCop. But yeah, uh, he also wrote the second Anaconda movie, which... Not amazing. Uh, he wrote the second Starship Troopers, which has a significantly lower rating than this one. I honestly, I think I only watched it once. I don't think I liked it, but it's really difficult to follow up. I don't know that this is a movie that I feel necessarily needs a sequel. And... Yeah. The... the yeah, and, you know, directed by Paul Verhoeven. Just unbelievably talented. You know, I'm not going to make excuses. He's definitely said and done some things that are skeevy, but... It's, yeah, his, his movies are... Most of the movies I've seen him make are absolutely amazing. And... Let's see... Yeah, so before I dig into that, according to Wikipedia, several filmmakers have named it as an influence or among their favorite films, including Ari Aster, Margaret Brown, Macaulay Culkin, David Lowry, Robert Rodriguez, which really shows, you know, he also has, you know, when, when he can, he fills his movies with brutal gore. Eli Roth, who I also hear loves gore, I don't think I've watched... A single one of his movies, I hear bad things about them. Riley Stearns, Quentin Tarantino makes a ton of sense. James Wan and Edgar Wright. And yeah, uh, this movie got multiple sequels and video game adaptations. Watched the first sequel, was disappointed. Played a demo of one of the games, was impressed. It was a, a shooter. I believe there's at least one where it's like... Ah, what's the word? Um... Real-time strategy. I have not played that one. I just heard that it exists. This is one of those movies where I recommend both the film and the, the riff tracks for it. And in general, all riff tracks I'm familiar with are great. Uh, Heroes, The Dark Knight, Spider-Man 3, The Raimi One, Battlefield Earth, which I can now only watch with riff. Only got through it once without... And, uh, yeah, other than them, there's Beowulf, Wonder Woman 1984, X-Men, Eon Flux, all 11 Star Wars movies, Avengers Endgame, uh, Captain America 1, the first Avengers movie, the first Avatar, the first Thor, X-Men 2, and the original Predator movie. And, yeah, so... Ranked worst to best, keeping in mind I love all of them, they're all amazing, I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all, yes, the bottom two I do love, ironically, all the Paul Verhoeven written and directed films I've seen, Showgirls, Hollow Man, Basic Instinct, Total Recall, Robocop, and at the end of this review I'll let you know where this, where Starship Troopers ranks among those. Paul Verhoeven knew that if he made a movie criticizing fascism openly, it would make a lot of people defensive, shut off their brain, refuse to listen, so he had to make a stealth criticism, and he actually managed to make it so subtle that a lot of people, including professional critics, didn't realize that it was a satire. The entire movie not only plays as, but is presented as, canonically, a propaganda film for the fascist regime. And like a lot of propaganda, if you're not the kind of person who would join, it's going to be very clear to you all the things that are wrong with it. Every so often the movie will cut to a brief TV segment that supports the regime, 
you know, this is a very clever element that helps make it clear how the supporters of the regime, regime could possibly actually support it. It controls all information that they receive, changing what doesn't fit, sometimes just with how it's presented. This is crucial for real fascists, so I greatly appreciate its inclusion here. And the, the you know, you know that you're about to watch an amazing Paul Verhoeven film if there is an in-universe, like, TV element, you know, if you see, like, news reports or the kind of, that, that kind of thing, you know, you have it here, you have it in the original Robocop. One example of how the fascist regime, regime strips your individuality is the co-ed showers that the characters themselves treat as the most natural thing in the world, showing how they've completely internalized those values. And yes, I realize that Kyle of Rouse Held High posits it is the result of the Dutch relationship of nudity being much more relaxed since Paul Verhoeven is Dutch. I can imagine that that's at least part of it. I would definitely argue the result is what I just mentioned. I think both things can be true. I have to admit, I find it extremely difficult to believe that America would come to that kind of change, even given two to three hundred years, what with its prudish relationship to the human body, all of its repressed sexuality, you know, its intense, which is baked into their brand of Christianity, especially considering that fascism doesn't tend to fight against, but rather fight using Christianity. There's a lot of aspects of Christianity that lead to it being an eager partner to fascism. And the, let's see, yeah, it, it could easily work as simply the kind of thing it is satirizing, in part because it is, you know, it is so great at rendering it. An action film with melodramatic elements of high school drama, love triangle, dramatic football game, American football, not real football, war scenes. It's using these familiar scenes and tropes to criticize the tropes and fascism and point out a connection between the kind of emotion-driven fiction that on the surface it appears to be and actual fascist propaganda. And the action is really exciting while choreographed, the well choreographed, the violence and gore are very effective, make the action feel much more visceral than the PG-13 action movies, which would start dominating the box office not many years after this movie came out, like early to mid-2000s. I think the first film I noticed it, that kind of thing being in was SWAT from 2003. And those movies also brought with them this two safe kind of, like, fighting scenes where, like, you know, it's almost more like showing off, look at what these actors are capable of doing, where in this movie, as with Paul Verhoeven movies in general, when someone takes a punch, it looks like it hurts, you know. The, the man really does not seem interested in making movies where violence is just cool. He wants us to feel it as well. The movie directly acknowledges the fact that American football is sometimes is supposed to get young people ready for military service. There are clear rules of engagement, tactics, physical prowess are crucial. There are few leaders, the coach, the judge, and the quarterback. Violence and aggression are rewarded, not frowned upon, as is the case with various other sports. Victory is to be achieved at any cost. Everyone is encouraged to celebrate the jocks as heroes. Women are given the role of keeping spirits high. There's a very clear implication that victory on the field leads fairly directly to sex with cheerleaders. And the movie shows the utter lack of humanity with fascism, of, of fascism. There's one point in, in one of the TV segments, a cow is sacrificed to a bug just for the purposes of demonstration when they could easily have used a dead animal instead, and in one clip, a bug is shot in a way that specifically doesn't kill it, and then it's executed. Again, just to demonstrate, you could easily have done it through animation. You know, that you know that's the kind of thing. Like in more humane societies, yeah, you know they they talk about you know this is this this kind of thing will kill a person, they don't show a dead body or the, you know, unless they're like trying to do a, do a, you know, scared straight kind of thing with, with drugs or drunk driving or that kind of thing. But other than that, they don't tend to, you know, 
The choice of bugs is also very telling. Fascists routinely dehumanize their enemies, say that they're animals, not human. You know, the they said of Jewish people that they're more like rats than human beings, and you know, killing rats is just necessary. They spread disease. They cowardly flee sinking ships instead of rearranging deck chairs like any good capitalist would. So as to make it easier to kill, because of the strong aversion humans who are not sociopaths have towards killing other humans. And I think it's noteworthy that in this movie, most of the people that we see encounter the bugs, actually encounter them, are military. And, you know, by then, maybe they've been brainwashed enough that they do see them as bugs, when in reality, they might not be. And yes, I know, I might be overanalyzing. I do that sometimes. And, yeah, we're told in order to become a citizen, you have to perform service. And, you know, certainly if that ever means anything other than military service, the movie never shows that, so it's fair to assume that that is the only way to serve in the Federation. That is the only way to gain the right to vote, to procreate, to enter politics. You know, in other words, they can indoctrinate people before those people can exercise any political control before they have any children, it's very logical to assume the vast majority of the children are also going to be indoctrinated into acceptance and support of this military dictatorship from childhood. At that point, going against the military, you know, might be seen as desertion for the adults. You know, the the there are almost no characters in this that actually question the regime and the the sort of what's the word, the um, the narrative that the regime puts forth. There's this very, very nicely done clip from one of the TV, you know, segments where there's like a debate and this, this patient scientist is trying to get a word across and there's this other guy who's who literally says, your ideas are offensive, offensive, you know, th this is, this is beyond debate. We cannot debate that there might be something more to this. This is ridiculous. I, I am not even going to entertain this notion, you know, and really props to the actor playing the the debater because he really nails it. Like, it just, like, it feels like it's physically painful for him to consider the ideas being put forth, which, you know, not everybody's great, that sort of thing. My opinion Maybe don't do a debate then if you if if the idea of the other person presenting ideas that challenge the the um, the dominating narrative is just offensive to you. If you can't, you know, and he doesn't actually really explain why it's offensive. And you know, for sure, like sometimes conservatives when they enter a debate, they will say actually offensive things. But these tend to be things that we on the left can point out, well, yeah, that's offensive because this, this, and this. Where here, no, dude just seems like he is not willing to consider that the government might be wrong about something. Which is, of course, why he was chosen to debate the this person who has an opposing view. I recommend reading the IMDb effect as well as IMDb trivia. The movie has fairly strong CG for its time. I will grant some of the stuff doesn't look amazing. Some of the textures are not completely convincing. But they do a really great mix between the CG and practical. And they go practical whenever they can. Like, whenever a bug, like, stabs someone... Yeah, they actually built the the stabby part and, you know, attached to the actor or shoved through the dummy, whichever the case may be. And this this is actually, this is one of the few movies from this time, from like the late 90s, where the effects are not allowed to just ruin the, the scenes that have effects, you know. It's made by people who understand that as much as CGI can do, which, you know, you can under, you can kind of understand why some people were overwhelmed by it, because it opened up, it, it allowed them to do things that had never been possible with practical effects, and, and you know, never will be possible with practical effects. 
but it was made by people who had experience with practical effects and they looked at the CG and they were like, you know, I, I can kind of see where, you know, it's just not quite as convincing, you know. And let's see. I love the mix of cheesiness and po-faced seriousness, just like propaganda movies and American, a lot of American action movies. And, uh, yeah, I love the movie's use of gore and violence. You know, it, it comes across as very exaggerated. It's been called comic book violence. It stands in such stark contrast to the jingoism. Sure, there are people who would say that recently I've been bringing up diversity and casting in too many of my movies, so you probably won't be surprised that I'm doing that again. You gotta admit, the fact that Johnny Rico from Buenos Aires is played by a blonde, blue-eyed Aryan is patently ridiculous. I do honestly think that it's intentional whitewashing. As part of the satire, you'll note there are, you know, there are not that many non-white characters throughout the movie. I, I do really appreciate that the movie makes it clear they're just as gung-ho. You know, this is really a society where everyone has fully accepted the regime. Let's see, which is, of course, you know, yeah, fascists love the idea that they can control everyone. You know, you'll never hear me say that a movie should be applauded for not having more diversity in casting than it does. I've heard some say that the book is also satire. Others say it's fascist. I haven't read it. It does seem like the film is very hostile towards the novel, criticizing it. Um, you know, the the... Paul Verhoeven himself, very, very left-leaning, tried to read the book and said that it was just, he couldn't get through it. It was so right-wing. And, you know, that's the thing. Some, some people think that this movie is very right-wing. So it, it can sometimes be difficult, and I do also think it is worth noting, you know, the the they're from different eras. You know, the, the book is from 1959 which was also you know basically the the book was written during the Cold War and you know not a huge amount of time after World War II whereas this movie was written after the Vietnam War after the fall of the the Soviet Union so there's very, very different perspectives going into it. And, you know, what's considered left-leaning, what was considered left-leaning in 1959, yeah, by today's standards might seem, you know, conservative because we try to go further as time, you know, we, in time we realize more and more the people who've been hurt and that we can try to help as leftists so I can imagine that might be what it is you know what what the exact truth is some say various parts of the military stuff feels like the military are not doing the most to avoid casualties this is part of the point during World War one at least one French general sent endless troops at machine gun nests which mowed them down and he said bullets are no match for French courage and this is just one of the countless examples of this sort of thing. During the Vietnam War, the American military really struggled to adapt to fight the way that the Viet Cong did. The movie is just cri criticizing real life. It's not saying this is how we should do things. You know, this is something that some people struggle with in, in satire and other media. You know, in general, good media, in my opinion, tends to criticize rather than simply reflect, just, yeah, just reflect and say, this is what, criticize and reflect, rather than say, this is how things should be, they say, this is how things are, and that's bad. And, you know, in this case, you know, how things have been, and we have to be careful we never do that again. And, let's see. The, um, yeah, you know, there, there are multiple cases in this movie of the military, of this regime, really struggling to, like, they, they seem 
they seem to not completely comprehend what they're dealing with. And that's the kind of thing that you really have to try to avoid, avoid in war. You know, the, I see war as sometimes a necessary evil. A lot of wars that have been fought were not necessary at all. They were driven by, sometimes just by ego. Sometimes there was a sense that, you know, if we don't fight this war, we're going to die. We're going to starve to death or something along those lines. But in a lot of those cases, it would have been so much better if they could just enter a trade agreement with the countries that they ended up, you know, fighting wars against. And that is what we saw at the end of World War II, which in part, you know, I'm not making any excuses for the, the Nazis, you know, but some other Western countries did push the Germans really, like, really just essentially humiliating them, like, going out of their way to make them feel defeated after World War I, and this was something that I'd like to think they thought, you know, if we really just grind them into the, you know, if we push them down and down and down, they'll never dare fight again, more than just, you know, we, it will, it will feel cathartic to us to, to humiliate them. But, you know, you, when you just look at, you know, again, the Nazis were completely wrong, but you can understand how there was fertile ground for them to convince people. And, yeah, you know, after World War II, you know, for some countries it took a while, but countries were made to give up their colonies, and now we trade with countries all over the world instead of, you know, yeah, feeling like we have to colonize them. And I think it's perfect that one battle cry of the fascist forces is, do you want to live forever? And yes, I realize that at least one historical person said it as well. It's such a perfect way to show that the fascist regime does not care about the frequent death of their own forces, which, again, often completely avoidable. You know, as if the only alternative to living forever, which, yeah, that does kind of, that does sound kind of silly and selfish on its face, you know, and I don't know, uh, I'm not saying that there's any, like, recent story that made, you know, big headlines that's making me pause it, but I don't know, maybe if you're really rich and you feel like you want to live forever, maybe just accept that we all die and stop using you know the HRT that trans people need and are too often denied and the the uh, anti di you know the yeah treatment for diabetes yeah for for diabetes that you know yeah also saves lives but yeah, you know, as if the only alternative is to die right now in a meaningless way, but it's being roared by your superior, according to the military, at least. Everyone seems really into it, so there must be something to it, screams the lizard brain. Some people don't like that the film, unlike the book, does not say that it is good to serve in the military, saying it's important to give yourself to something bigger than yourself. I agree, that is important. I recommend volunteering for a charity. That way, unlike with military service, you'll actually be making the world a better place. You will survive it, and you won't maim or kill anybody else. That is, unless you seriously fuck it up. Now, let's see. Yeah, you know, I mentioned, you know, yeah, war and violence in general. Occasionally necessary evils, a huge amount of the time, not at all necessary, and will very frequently only make things worse. You know, there's there's a lot of deaths in throughout history where, like, if you trace it all the way back to the source, like, one person or one group of people killed another person or another group of people, and ever since then, it's, you know, back and forth revenge. You know, I understand that that can be cathartic, but it is not good for the world. 
violence. See, you know, to be clear, like absolutely, it should be stopped. You know, if if someone is trying to kill you or members of your group, you know, yeah, we should stop them, but not by killing them, not with, you know, unnecessary. You know, sometimes they may need to be like arrested, for example, but nothing. Yeah, nothing disproportionate, nothing that goes beyond what is absolutely necessary. Now, it's, yeah, the movie notes, before there was any aggression by the bugs, some Mormons went to a place they knew the bugs were living, which led to a bloodbath. And before you say, oh, that makes them sound violent, think about all the Republicans who are dying to shoot someone on their property. There have been stories about people who actually did it. Like, there's that one guy who's literally just trying to ask for a phone because his car broke down and the property owner shot him, you know. And we also, we don't know exactly what happened. There have been a number of times throughout history where Christians went to a place, most likely to colonize it, and they were the ones who started the violence. You know, the fact that the Mormons ended up dead does not mean that they did nothing violent to, to start it. So, yeah. It's, you know, uh, does that sound victim blamey? I don't mean it to. Um, obviously believe victims, but the, the, just, yeah, the, f also do keep in mind, it, it's not just like, oh, you know, the Mormons end up that, no, it leads to all of, you know, the, the entire earth declaring war on the entire species of arachnids. So, yeah, you know, it's the, the even if the Mormons themselves did not engage in violence, it's an extremely disproportionate response. And honestly, I, um, let's see. Is the... Let's see, did I end up writing... Um, yeah, you know, I, I can't help but wonder if it's supposed to be like the, the, the kind of thing of... Um, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name, Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, which, you know, I, I, sometimes Americans, the thing they get most mad, it's especially American conservatives, the thing they get most mad at is when another country outdoes them at something they think they're the best at, like, it was just military strategy, it was, you know, the fact that they hadn't declared war before the attack, you know, was very, like, you can you can see an argument for that they should have done that, but the counter attack was completely disproportionate. So yeah, I can't help but wonder if that's what if if the Mormons are like the Pearl Harbor attacks. The movie has a lot of violence. Director Paul Verhoeven saw a lot of real life violence in World War II and says he just films the violence in society, which makes a lot of sense. I think an argument could be made that maybe every movie that has a lot of violence or should have by its source uh, uh, subject matter should have at least one person who's seen real life violence and appreciates the weight of it having a lot of influence over it. And uh, some people say it's not funny enough to be satire, mistaking satire and parody. There are films that are both, like you know, South Park Beer are longer and uncut, as well as Team America are both of these things. I don't think this movie is supposed to be an outright parody of, like, specific... Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, some, some people say that the movie should make it more obvious that it's satire. I don't think all satire has to be really obvious. America has been defined by war for the entire existence of the country. At first, they waged only the wars they felt they had to, fighting the British, engaging in the Civil War that the South started. With World War I and World War II, they started to feel like they could and should protect the entire world, you know, be the, 
hero from the the western the, the genre of the mo of movie riding into a foreign town recognizing the bad guy or bad guys taking them out in an honorable way then moving on we see this in the korean war where i do believe they may have been asked to intervene vietnam which they took over for the french and did not at all look at how badly you know how the french had struggled there and the middle eastern wars where they did not attack those who had attacked them i realize a country in the middle east did attack on 9-11, but that was not the military of any country. Most of the terrorists in the planes were Saudi Arabian. America did not attack Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia is happy to sell them oil. Now, Universal Soldier, Team America, South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, and this movie itself all have excellent commentary on America and its relationship to war, although Universal Soldier isn't an outright satire. In each of these movies, we see completely preventable deaths on account of powerful people who don't care that these people are dying. They don't see them as human beings who deserve to be treated with humanity. They see them as completely disposable. We also see political corruption in each of these films. The leaders care only about their own goals, not the people they send to fight their own battles, certainly not the enemies they fight. Uh, let's see, and the, the violence the militaries in these movies carry out is disproportionate, done not to prevent greater violence, though they do claim forcefully that it's a kill or be killed scenario, but for revenge, for personal reasons. Demonizing the enemy, refusing to acknowledge their humanity, they point out, these films point out the mainstream media's role in allowing these atrocities to continue for so long. They feature evil people tricking good people to distract from the evil that they do, and Often the things they do to trick people are very superficial, criticizing the analytical skills of the average person considering that they are fooled. Now, normally I only do this following bit at the very end of the review, and this is not the end of the review yet, but I do want to dive into the worst aspect, in my opinion, of this film. While I absolutely respect the choice, and I do think that the actual physical appearance really worked. You know, Casper Van Dien was cast in part because he resembled the Aryan ideal as depicted in the propaganda movies of Lenny Riefenstahl. He 100% absolutely does look like he stepped right out of a Nazi propaganda poster. I do think that the movie would be at least a little stronger than it already is if the cast were, yes, pretty people, but ones who were also really talented actors. And Wikipedia says Verhoeven later said Starship Troopers could have benefited from casting actors for their ability instead of looks. So, you know, ultimately he did realize that himself. I would recast Johnny Rico with Christian Bale, who has the conventionally attractive face and body, can do action, and is willing to get completely willing to get naked on camera. He's substantially more talented than Casper Van Dien. And, you know, Casper Van Dien. I forget if they filmed it and it ended up not in the movie or they just scripted it and cast him but ended up not filming it. But Casper Van Dien was supposed to play Patrick Bateman, not in the American Psycho movie, but in the um, the, the Rules of Attraction, which also features uh, Patrick Bateman. The, the book does and the original screenplay did, but yeah, ultimately that scene isn't in the movie. But yeah, that was supposed to be Casper Van Dien, so, you know, clearly someone, you know, casting movies thinks that there is a resemblance there. And, yeah, um, Denise Richards, I think I would probably... I think Amy Smart, based on her performance in Road Trip and both crank movies, I think Amy Smart would have done better. And something that people who haven't watched this movie in a while forget, Amy Smart is in this movie. She just, she doesn't have a huge role. And it was basically, it was before she was really famous. So, yeah, you know, that's basically, but, but yeah, you know, she has the appearance and at least later also the, the acting talent. I, I suppose I don't know if at the time she had the acting talent. And I, I do respect the, the fact that they basically raided, like, Melrose Place and such for, you know, young, pretty people to, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Um, when it comes to 
Right, and and I do want to say, yeah, um, I love that Rue McClanahan, um, who you may know from the Golden Girls, Blanche Devereaux, she appears in this, and she, like, I the moment that I read it in a review, I was like, oh my god, that is her. But I, I totally didn't see it until someone pointed it out, because she carries herself completely different from Blanche. I hear, I never watched Golden Girls. I, that's, n no. But the, the yeah, and, and Dean Norris, uh, you know, does well. That's, it's not really a surprise, but it's still nice to see. Um, yeah, then, you know, yeah, I think Dina Meyer and Jake Busey are, are fine for what they're asked to, to do. Neil Patrick Harris does legitimately fairly well for his, his age and, like, this was, you know, this was back when he was, like, the kid from Doogie Howser, you know. Like, he's he's shown since that he's a very talented actor. I think this might have been the first time he, he really got to show that. Now, yeah, as far as recasting, you know, Clancy Brown and Michael Ironside, I just think that those roles would have been better handled by... Ah, did I have you? Did you, did you buy it? Obviously, they're some of the best in the film. Michael Ironside absolutely kills it as Jean Raschak, which just, yeah. Um, and that's also, you know, Michael Ironside and Paul Verhoeven, they're really, really good together. You know, Ironside is also amazing in the Total Recall. Uh, yeah. And yeah, Clancy Brown, you know, I've seen him in other stuff. This will always be the thing I think of when I think of him. Uh, Drill Sergeant Zim. And let's see. The, um, yeah, so the, the opening of the movie immediately really does, you know, sets the tone and gives you a really good idea of what the movie is going to be like, including featuring some very graphic violence. So, like, you know, if the opening several minutes bug you, I swear that I did not realize that I was going to make that pun before I did. Yeah, uh, take a stroll out down Washout Lane. This movie is not for you. And, uh, yeah, so I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits what came before. I think the ending is absolutely perfect. It has been misunderstood by some, but I think they made the, the right choice with it. And, right, I suppose I, I'll, I'll briefly talk about, so, Casper Van Dien plays Johnny Rico, and he's pretty much like the everyman, like, he's a, he's a jock, and he's in love with the prettiest girl in class, and just, yeah, um, you know, he's not the, the smartest, which, you know, it's very much supposed to send the message to the people watching this propaganda that, hey, I don't have to be smart, critical think. If you have critical thinking, if you really pursue science, best you're going to do is to have to sit across from a debater who says that your ideas are patently offensive on their face, you know. And, yeah, you know, he has the physicality, and he does look like just, yeah. Uh, Denise Richards uh, plays Carmen Ibanez, uh, who, Ibanez? Ibanez, I think is how they pronounce it. I don't mean any offense to, to let's see, Latin American, I think, community. Um, but, yeah, the, the, she's, yeah, she's the girl he's in love with. And, yeah, she really wants to, to become, you know, the, the, she wants to be a pilot. And the, the, yeah, um, Dina Meyer plays Dizzy Flores, who is also a jock and, you know, in love with, with Johnny. Jake Busey plays Ace Levy one of the f recruits 
And yeah, Neil Patrick Harris plays Carl's, Carl Jenkins, who is, he has like psychic powers. And I think that's all I'm going to say about his character. And yeah, Patrick Muldoon plays Xander Bakalov. And just like, you absolutely hate this guy. I, I, Let's see, he was also on Melrose Place. I don't at all remember his character, is what I would be saying if I ever watched Melrose Place. But yeah, like, just... He's so deliciously hateable in this movie, and he gets that. He's not under... He, you know, you can tell from his performance, he realizes we're supposed to, to hate his guts. And, yeah, Ironside plays this teacher that helps really shape the minds of, you know, the, yeah, several of the characters, when we first see them, they're in high school, they're graduating high school, you know, and he's a teacher who helps shape their minds, and Rue McClanahan's biology teacher, just, you know, yeah, very, very militaristic, which, you know, yeah. A lot of the adults in this movie are, and a lot of the young people come to be very militaristic. And, yeah, she has this, like, she's, yeah, she's talking about how th these bugs are greatly superior to, to human beings. And I think that is what I will... Yeah, um, um, Clancy Brown, I already mentioned, he plays a drill sergeant. It's very much like the, the, it's a take on the, the R. Lee Ermey, R.I.P., character from, um, Full Metal Jacket. And just, yeah, um, I didn't think that you could... I guess I don't know if I want to say it tops Full Metal Jacket, but I do think it matches it. Which is no mean feat. And... Let's see... Yeah, and the... So the... Yeah. Dialogue. The, the IMDb quote section has... Let's see how many entries. Six, nine. Nice. I wonder if anyone has considered adding at least one more, realized it was already the sex number, and decided against adding more. All of them are good. All, all of them are, are written just like, like I mentioned, you know, some of it's really, really like corny and, and ridiculous. Some of it is the, the you know, this, this much more serious stuff. The delivery of some of it, because of, you know, as I mentioned, the actors, not all amazing, suffer some, though, you know, again, yeah, uh, Ironside knows exactly how to deliver these lines, uh, so does Clancy Brown. And there are definitely times where Casper Van Dien succeeds, but this is one of those situations where, you know, as, speaking of fascist, you know, the movie 300, which, you know, both the book and the movie are quite fascist. You know, the the guy who plays the lead, I cannot believe I'm blanking on his name, uh, Gerard Butler, also has some pretty ridiculous stuff to, to say, but he nails every line, you know. A lot of it, he's like barking, like just, you know, it's, it's big and broad, it's operatic, you know. And I do think when, when Casper Van Dien, when it's about intensity, that he can bring. He, he, you know, at, yeah, at the time he was definitely capable of bringing intensity to it. You know, and I don't want to make it sound like I, I actually dislike him. I think he was perfect in the 1999 Sleepy Hollow as Brom Van Brunt. You know, I think that's the kind of thing where he really excels. The cinematography is really, really excellent. Um, so it was handled by Just Vacano, who has 75 uh, credits total and has done several other 
uh, uh, Verhoeven films, including Hollow Man, Showgirls, Total Recall, and Robocop. He also did Never Ending Story, the original Das Boot, and a bunch of stuff I never heard of. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, he was born in Germany, so yeah, some of it, you know, Das Boot is German, but he's one of those people who were so talented that yeah, Hollywood. Yeah, he he. Yeah, he he did some, some. Actually, yeah. Come to think of it, I guess each of the movies I've just mentioned were directed by either a German or a, a Dutchman. So maybe that's. But you know, he wasn't. Oh, that's right. Wolfgang Peterson died. I actually forgot about that. R.I.P. Incredibly talented director. Um, but yeah, the the. You know, it wasn't prevented. They were, you know, the studios weren't like, you can't use that guy, you know. And the editing was handled by Mark Goldblatt and Carolyn Ross. And Goldblatt has done, yeah, he, you know, he's done several of the big action movies, including several by James Cameron including True Lies, Terminator 2, and Terminator 1. You know, he also edited Rambo 2 and Commando, Predator 2. Um, yeah, you know, the, the... Clearly, you know, cast for his experience editing action. And, yeah, the action is very well edited. And he also... You know, he also has experience integrating special effects into action scenes, which not all 80s action, you know, I, you know, I do think that the original Die Hard is very well edited, among other, th you know, from the technical aspects, the politics of this, but the filmmaking is, is mostly excellent. The editor of that did not have to work in as many effect shots as, you know, Mark Goldblatt editing the Terminator movies, you know. And, yeah, Carolyn Ross has edited other stuff. Most of it is stuff I have not seen. Um, let's see. Ballistics X vs. Sever, which, yeah, it's, it's well edited. Um, it kind of looks like she did a bunch of, like, teen-oriented stuff, so... I can imagine she was brought in to, to really, yeah, make the, the teen scenes work. You know, she did stuff like Wedding Bell Blues, Meet Prince Charming. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, but she did also edit for The West Wing, which, frustratingly liberal is what I hear, but at least it is left wing. And the music was handled by Basil Polidorus, R.I.P. And, let's see. yeah, he composed for 94 different movies. And, yeah, he, he composed for On Deadly Ground, Robocop 3, Hunt for Red October, the first Robocop, Conan the Destroyer and Conan the Barbarian, so, you know, yeah, he had experience doing these big American action epics, and, right, the, the filming, this was filmed in some national parks, uh, yeah, various parts of South Dakota, Wyoming, and it really does, yeah, and also parts of downtown L.A. And, yeah, that adds a lot. This is one of those movies where the fact that they actually did go to this, like, desert area for a desert planet really helps sell it. Like, I, I cannot put into words how glad I am that this was not shot on, like, sound stages or something in, entirely. Some of it was. But, yeah, it really gets a lot. 
the action sometimes gets very big, uh, never to the point where you like lose. You can always follow what's going on. And the sound design is fantastic. Like, there's a lot of really nasty, you know, squishy, squelchy bug noises. And, like, when, when someone is stabbed or part of their body is crushed or something. And just fantastic work. Which, you know, it's, it's very necessary. You know, if, if you ever want to, you know, at some... You could try to, to watch a special effect of, like, gore... If you watch it without any audio, it doesn't have the same impact at all. Uh, you know, just the, the 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 sound it makes really helps sell it to the human brain that it's real. The movie is very well paced. I've seen some people say, oh, you know, there's too much. Like, it definitely, it is a movie that is made up of several parts. Uh, you know, the first chunk is high school, then there's some boot camp and then it becomes a war movie, some people really didn't respond to that. I think it works perfectly. I, I love the fact, like, the, the start of it, not, not the very, very start, because it shows a little of, of the war at the very start, but, like, the first chunk of the movie is largely, like, high school drama, like, you know, oh, he got caught, you know, making like a, you know, drawing a, making a love letter equivalent to his girlfriend. Uh-oh, and, you know, oh, time to, you know, let's, let's dissect a frog. It's biology class kind of stuff, you know, but on acid, because it's not a frog. It's one of the, the bugs that they're, they're, you know, that they consider their, their enemy. You know, oh, who will dance with who at prom and, and all this stuff, you know. And then, like, a little later, people's bodies are getting blown apart. And just, yeah, I, I think it's perfect because of the contrast and because of the fact that, yeah, a lot of military people have been recruited right out of school. You know, it's before they, you know, there's there's several reasons for this tactic. One is, they just finished school, they haven't started work or something like that yet. They haven't gotten married. You know, it's much harder to convince someone to go and do something where they might die if they have a situation that they're happy with, you know. They don't have children yet. All, you know, these, these different things that, that help make your life, you know, it, not everybody needs these things, but... For, for a lot of people, it provides stability and purpose in their lives. And, yeah, if you have that, nobody's going to be able to talk you into going somewhere where you might die and you might have, and, and you probably will have to kill someone, you know. Now, the movie is an hour and 59 and a half minutes long without end credits and an hour, that's, two hours and 11 minutes with and it's one of those you don't need to sit through the credits uh, you know and yeah um, the best element of this is the way that it managed to criticize fascism in a way that was subtle enough that a bunch of people who would have screamed about it if they had media literacy completely missed it and you know yeah, also, like, the, the, no, yeah, yeah, you know what, that one, that one does top out. That, that is the absolute best. Um, I already mentioned what I consider the worst thing. I didn't really see, most of the things I saw other people criticize about it, I've already argued against earlier in this video. I guess I'll I'll say, you know, it's not for everyone. I get that, you know, some people will think it's too violent. Some people refuse to consider the the points that it's trying to make. You know, some people didn't really appreciate that it was satire. You know, I saw one person specifically say that he thought it was a mistake that they had chosen to make the enemies bugs, not humans. 
and that by the end of the movie he was cheering for the humans to kill the bugs. And yeah, I already addressed why I think that is, you know, I think that was the right choice. And yeah, you know, I, th I, I appreciate his candor. And he does make clear that he, uh, they make it clear that they did understand that it's satire and it's criticizing this, you know. And yeah, for some people, it just, it will work, even if you realize it. The thing I was most worried about before the first time I watched it was an over-reliance on visual effects that would date poorly as most 90s visual effects. Not all effects, but visual effects specifically refers to, like, computer-generated kind of effect. You know, yeah, visual effects are not the same as practical effects. Special effects can cover both. But, yeah, it absolutely did not. They were They were careful to only use it when it was necessary and to like there's a there's a part where like the the ah, I don't know if I want to give it away I'll just say you know I'll keep it vague enough there's parts where the 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 CG will directly interact with something and the moment that they can they switch it out with practical which I guess I may have already said in the video anyway thing I was most looking forward to was more of Paul Verhoeven, and yeah, movie absolutely exceeded my expectations, as he tends to do. You know, once again, I will admit that, like, Hollow Man and Showgirls are not actually great, though the first chunk of Hollow Man is great. It's, I, in my opinion, it's really just like the last third or so where it really struggles you know I, th I think it makes at least one fundamental mistake which I I'm not gonna get into here because it would require spoilers the trailers do give too much away um, I do think you know the 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 trailers do give you a good idea of what the movies like but the you know the only thing it's missing is the satire element which is a big deal and you know some have theorized that that's part of why the movie didn't do as well financially and the cover and poster do not give too much away and give you an okay idea of what the movie is like Let's see. and right and apparently also some people just saw the the title and either didn't watch because they thought it was too silly of a title or did watch thinking it would be like Star Wars because both of them open with the word star I guess and yeah I don't know I the, before I watched it I knew it was Paul Verhoeven I had already watched you know the the I think Hollow Man might have been the only one that I hadn't watched by then I think I'd watched the other ones yeah you know it's I, I don't think there's any, no, no matter what title one of his movies might have, I'd be willing to give it a chance just based on how much he's proven himself. And yeah, so on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 71% on the tomato meter based on 79 reviews. 56 of them fresh. The average score is 6.40 out of 10. The audience score is 70% based on over 100,000 ratings, and the average rating is 3.7 out of 5. And yeah, the consensus is a fun movie if you can accept the excessive gore and wooden acting. And yeah, I've already addressed both of those points. And on Metacritic, it has a 52 out of 100 mixed or average um, 35 uh, yeah 50 percent mixed 35 percent positive and 15 percent negative ratings and let's see what were the yeah uh, you know looking over the yeah the the um, the negative reviews like, I'm not saying it's impossible to criticize this movie. Like I mentioned, the acting, I think, is, you know, needed to work. But a lot of the, the negative reviews from when it came out, just, they they didn't get what it was. Like, there, 
one one person says it has no moral purpose or intelligence and yeah one person says bizarrely discordant mixture that's part of the point and one says it's an empty video game just yeah the the users have given it 8.7 out of 10 universal acclaim 90 percent positive ratings five percent mixed four percent negative yeah and let's see right and on imdb there are 1242 user reviews which goes down to 1050 if you hide the ones with spoilers and yeah that really gives you an idea of how like this is a movie that a lot of people have watched and bothered to like write a review of you know there's movies that are much more recent you know like let's keep in mind like IMDB was not as big back when this movie first came out a lot of the people who've written you know it they came in much later it's it's a movie people have watched more recently than when it came out and bothered to go back and like vote you know rate and and like give a review to and such and it has a 7.3 out of 10 based on 310,000 votes 27.1 gave it 7 26.0 gave it 8 12.6 gave it 6 11.6 gave it 9 10.7 gave it 10 5.4 gave it 5 2.6 gave it 4 1.6 gave it 1 1.5 gave it 3 1.1 gave it 2 yeah th those sound like people who either didn't realize what it was saying or did and vehemently disagreed now I read the top 100 of the user reviews three of them were voted one out of ten uh, two were twos one gave it a three no one gave it a four or a five two gave it a six three gave it a seven twenty nine gave it eight twenty two gave it nine forty four gave it ten so yeah not only was this very positively received by like regular viewers it's also like there are some negative reviews but those tend to not be the most like popular by other users users and uh yeah uh the the i've already talked some about the the cg i've gone a little bit into the the practical effects but i think it's worth diving further into you know there's a lot of like blood and gore where it's like people finding the aftermath and you see like people completely torn apart and yeah bodies strewn across but there's also squibs there's uh, you know a number of scenes where people are stabbed and you see you know, you see the thing stick out of the wound, you see blood, you know, some, some blood will pump out, and, you know, there's some puppeteering, and, yeah, like, when the bugs are very close, it is actually, you know, yeah, practical, and I think that covers it for the effects, there's also some really solid stunt work, which helps sell it as well. Now the um, let's see. You know, some people take issue with the the nudity. I feel that it's there to make a point. Uh, I think it does a good job making that point. And I would definitely say that it is actually surprisingly restrained when it comes to actual like sexuality like this you know Paul Verhoeven is not a man who's uncomfortable with putting graphic sex scenes in his movies but this one doesn't really have that and I ultimately it wouldn't really add to the movie I mean I don't know if you know I, I think an argument could be made that it it definitely there's more of it than is necessary in basic instinct and 
the the and especially showgirls you know but that is part of what they were trying to do with those movies you know those are erotic you know you know that to an extent to an extent that is like debatable but they were meant to be erotic and this movie isn't really the the nudity that we do see tends to be just like you know well they don't really you know these people don't really care that they're naked in front of each other and yeah um, I rate this eight satirical takedowns of Nazis out of ten and the movie absolutely holds up you know some of the effects not completely you know the, like today you could make everything in this movie look photorealistic but back then they couldn't but the the practical effects are are really great and the the points that it makes hold up like it's actually kind of wild that this movie did you know it came out before 911 and yeah you know it kind of predicted some of the 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 stuff that would be yeah the the media complacency the the you know recruiting young people right out of school and attacking someone who didn't actually attack and and doing a a ridiculously over you know I, I forget the number but you know Americans have killed way more Middle Easterners than the terrorists killed on 9-11 I think this is a movie that I you know it is already right now it is popular I think it deserved better on release I think it is a movie that in the future could become even more popular you know right now we are seeing fascism try to take over Western democracies and yeah I, th I think this movie can do a lot in helping us to to recognize the things that yeah and yeah so the updated ranking worst to best everything Paul Verhoeven that I've seen Showgirls, Hollow Man, Basic Instinct, Total Recall, Robocop, and Starship Troopers. This is my absolute favorite Paul Verhoeven film, and the you know the fact that it was not this like massive success. I forget was it an outright bomb? Hold on. Starship Troopers. Let's see the. box office yeah it had some initial success but negative reviews poor word of mouth led to the film's box office grosses dropping week after week until it left theaters and yeah it it earned 121 million against a budget of 100 to 110 million so that's yeah that's that's a failure and uh, yeah, Verhoeven believed audience misconceptions about the film were the result of poor marketing, uh, you know, th which presented it as an action film instead of a satire. And so, yeah, now that brings us to the spoiler sections. So, gonna start with notes taken while watching on paper and you know yeah once again spoilers throughout the rest of the video you have been warned so yeah even from the very opening of the film we have military score and we open on one of the propaganda TV you know yeah parts and you know you you're sitting there watching this thing and like why are you talking into a microphone you know he's he's literally standing there talking about oh you know this is a very hostile planet get out of there then why are you and the and the other guys just filming it and he like 
make sure to film the, which I suppose, you know, okay, if you're if you're there, maybe he feels like, well, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna try to get the shot of my life. You know, but like just like film from further away, you know, or or talk about what you've heard about the planet, but no. You know, he gets just, and, and, you know, some of the other characters literally screaming, like, get out of here, you know, just, yeah. And, yeah, we see Johnny, I, I appreciate that, like, we, you know, at this point we don't know Johnny yet, so it's it hits different than later when we see this scene from his point of view. But, yeah, the fact that he survives the wound that we see him get here at the start is completely ridiculous, which is part of the point of the satire. The reality is, you know, yeah, some some people do get to, to be really impressive in, in combat, but a lot of people just end up dying really brutally. And then after, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, he, he did his duty or, or something, you know, trying to obscure the fact that someone died who, you know, we're all going to die eventually, but they died way before they, they, you know, would have of natural causes. And often, you know, with nothing accomplished, like, you know, the, the French general, I mentioned sending guys to just die, to just be mowed down. And... I, I really appreciate the, the detail that, like, Carmen is smiling as she's saying these awful, awful things. Uh, like, the, the, um, there's this, um, let's see, in, in, um, in From Dusk Till Dawn, there's this newscaster played by Kelly Preston, R.I.P., uh, you know, it's it's this ah what is what is the song lyric again? Um, something about um hmm. something about like the the you know this this you know ah what's the word? Yeah, like the the um, something about like this this woman, you know, big smile as she says some as she's reporting on something truly horrible. You know, like like she's literally sitting there saying, "The people of Hiroshima wouldn't say anything. The city was destroyed." And it's like, stop smiling. And yeah, one of one of. Rico, one of Johnny's classmates says, we're going to kill Tesla. I mean, I think Elon's doing a pretty good job by himself. Let's see. Yeah, and we actually, like, we literally witness high school bullying at the start. And, you know, in half an hour, people's bodies are getting torn apart. Like, it's so absurd. I love it. And... Let's see... Yeah, I like Carl saying, you know, I, I can't do human yet. And yeah, you know, by the end of the movie, he can put thoughts in other people, in other human beings' heads. You know, he tells Johnny where Carmen is. And... And Johnny gets distracted like a buffoon. And, you know, Carmen smiles at him. He's like, <laughs> and, you know, um, what's his face? Xander smacks into him. And he almost, you know, they almost lose the, the football game. Let's see. Right. And, and, you know, Rico, Johnny's parents try to talk him out of the, um, yeah. Of, of going, oh right, it is Christopher Curry, isn't it? Cool. Uh, playing his father, you know, and, and yeah, he says, Razchak, <laughs> silly name, implying, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's one of these racist elites who are out of touch with reality and other classes of people, which is, you know, yeah, there's a lot of truth to that.
sadly. And right, and in in you know, um, yeah. Johnny goes up to to Rash Jack after the the game and asks him for advice, and Rash Jack basically worships the individual's will to act, which you know America does as well, and fascist countries, yeah, fully fascist countries, I suppose I should say. Yeah, and uh, you know, Carmen says, "Are you jealous? You don't have to be jealous." That comes later, and yeah, and we see them enroll, and they're basically doing the pledge of like they they look like they're doing the pledge of allegiance. You know, I really don't think that's accidental. The pledge of allegiance, like it, it is. Obviously, it can be a good thing to pledge yourself to something greater than yourself. But pledging allegiance to a flag, a nation, you know, like, that is a recipe for getting people to go along with horrible things. You know, you should be pledging allegiance to the good of all mankind, not one specific, uh, yeah. And I appreciate that part of the allegiance that they, you know, and they do literally, literally say, we pledge, you know, and they say two, at least two years of service and however much more the state demands, you know. So basically, you know, if there's a war on, that's it. They're just, they're going to be in the war until they die, you know, and... Let's be honest, this nation the, the, that we see in the movie, they would probably just start another war as soon as this one's over. Let's see. Yeah, and, and you know, Johnny's parents, they don't want to help. They don't want to contribute. They just vacation, which, yeah, you know, that is, again, sadly, very accurate to, yeah. And let's see. Yeah, you know, uh, Carmen tells uh, Johnny, you know, don't forget to write. Uh, you know, I think he forgot enough math that he's not going to be able to forget how to write as well. And yeah, and then we see. We see this one propaganda video where children are handed a fully loaded automatic rifle and then they fight over it and like like they play tug of war over this thing. Like any second now, one of the you know, a finger is gonna slip and several of them are gonna get blasted and you know just yeah. And yeah, and they, you know, I, I, I'm not certain if the, the news report meant to equate Mormons to colonists. You know, it's, it says the Mormons didn't realize that there were other colonists. You know, that implies that the Mormons themselves were colonists, colonizers, you know. But yeah, you know, sadly, Christians have done a lot of colonizing that, you know, some Christians like to say, oh, you know, the reason that Christianity has so many believers all across the world is because it's the one true religion. You know, everybody just, you know, naturally believes. And so, no, it's because Christians went all over the world killing people who refused to believe. Let's see. Right, and we, yeah, we get to the, the drill sergeant and such, and, you know, this one guy, you know, I forget, was, was it the one who chuckled, or was it, I don't remember exactly, but he does something that pisses off Zim, and so he, Zim says, you see that armory? Run around it, and he's like, oh, okay, fine, you know, and he starts to, and then Zim shouts at another, like, and I, yeah, another officer or something there, and says, keep pace, to which the guy, like, unfolds the baton, 
and runs after him. So, like, implying, you know, if the guy starts to slow down, he's going to hit him until he, you know, runs fast enough. Or if he, like, falls over, he's probably going to hit him a bunch more. And, yeah, and then we have the one guy, I think it's Breckenridge, who just, like, I feel bad for this guy. He's he's written to, like, just constantly screw up, you know, big and dumb, as they, they keep saying, you know, Eric Bruscotter. You know, just, poor guy, The his face does kind of make him look like a, a big, dumb guy. So I don't think I've really seen him in much else crimson tide the fan the line of fire so he's done his share of these yeah um not really don't really know him from anything else other than those but yeah and i don't i don't even remember what he plays in those um but but yeah you know he's like you know maybe i can take out zim and Zim completely unnecessarily breaks his arm and, you know, uh, uh, it's my arm, sir. I think it's broken. Medic! Just, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and the... Yeah, and, and Dizzy shows up and also immediately fights Zim. Like... It's completely clear, basically the only thing that is respected in this military, as in many others, are just physical, you know, and uh, yeah, aggression both physically and psychologically, and physical prowess. That's it. That's the only thing they seek in you. Let's see, and uh, yeah, when when... Ace refuses to get to the back of the line. You know, there's an officer right there, and he doesn't get involved because he wants to see how it goes. You know, he wants to see are some of them gonna like start fighting this guy over his place in line? Is anyone gonna back away from, you know, if if someone backs away from, you know, something like this? Maybe they're not going to kill bugs. Maybe we should just get rid of them. And, yeah, and the various, you know, they argue over who should be squad leader. They never stop to say, you know, should this entire military operation be happening? And, and uh, Johnny's video letter, or uh, video, video log? Vlog? I guess... I guess that's a thing. Yeah, I don't know. You know, is is completely ruined by the other, you know, mobile infantry people singing, uh, mooning, playing instrument. Yeah. Let's see. And I really love that, you know... When Carmen and the Amy Smart character, uh, hold on, her name is, wow, she's far down, right, she doesn't even have, yeah, she's Pilot Cadet, holy crap, she's very far down, I suppose she doesn't have a lot of screen time, it's just wild to, to think, you know, she has such a big role in movies that came out just a few years later, but yeah, at this time she hadn't been discovered yet but yeah you know Carmen and pilot cadet are like first one there gets to fly you know the, the vessel so they're like children playing you know that's the kind of thing that like yeah children say when when playing you know last one you know let's race each other to the to the thing you know which is of course you know if you can convince young people that you get to be immature in the military you know which I suppose some people can get away with you know yeah they're more likely to you know no it's just another competition you know just let's see who's who's faster or stronger or kind of thing let's see you know it it isn't 
actually serious uh, for them uh, yet. And this is also what we saw in that ad. You know, the, the, yeah, the children struggling over the, the rifle. You know, I mean, uh, call me crazy, if some, if, if like a, a military person comes with their, their massive gun near me, I'm not going to be like, ooh, can I touch it? You know, I'd, I'd be like, um, is this safe? Are you, you know, yeah. <laughs> and Xander happened to run into Carmen, although he does at least admit it. Just, yeah, he's, he's, we love to hate this guy. Just so, so fun. Let's see. And, yeah, we see, you know, the cadets in both the... Um, yeah, both both these pilot cadets and the the mobile infantry cadets are over eager. And uh, what does that say? Uh, oh, right, right, yeah. Um, they're not, you know, they and they get a gun and a, a plane to fly, or yeah, vessel to fly before they've worked that out of their system. You know, it's actually extremely dangerous. But we've ha we have a perpetual war to keep. You know, this is a war machine. We've got to keep going. Can't wait to, yeah, until they're actually ready. And, yeah, the movie draws a direct, uh, you know, line between being great at sports and doing well in the military. You know, Johnny actually uses the, the you know, American football tactic with Dizzy to, to win the, the simulation. And I've seen some people say that it really wasn't Johnny's fault that um, the other uh, Breckenridge, that Breckenridge was, you know, killed because the helmet wouldn't have prevented, you know, because of where his where on his face he was shot. I I think that it was a mistake to take the helmet off. Let's see. And we see, you know, the, the young cadet, you know, she, she quits because of the, you know, she can't live with killing, you know, yeah, she can't go on in the military after killing a fellow cadet. And that is how a lot of people, you know, for a lot of people, killing someone, you know, just haunts them. And... And we're told in after three weeks, Carmen is better than the navigation, which, you know, just like this propaganda film is basically screaming, this could be you. Don't you want to outdo people who've been doing it for a very long time kind of thing. And we, of course, have to have a countdown because this is Amer an American action movie. Where did those come from? Where did they go? And I appreciate that literally every single vlog still feels weird to say such a such a weird word. I don't think it'll ever catch on. You know, between these cadets, there's always an audience. They have no privacy because the military doesn't think they deserve privacy. They're not being treated as human beings, you know, in any ways. The bugs whacked us. Amazing line. Delivered with conviction. It's home. Well, not anymore it isn't. And, yeah, you know, Zim, is, you know, is this your, uh, yeah, is, ah, crap, I don't have one I can rip up. Let's see. No, I just don't have one nearby. You know, is this your signature? Doesn't look like it to me. You, gotta, you know, just, yeah. 
because when you live under a fascist dictatorship, contracts are meaningless. And yeah, um, Johnny says he doesn't want a tattoo to which the others say, oh, what, your, your skin is too pretty for it, or something like that, you know, which, like, that's a terrible argument. You know, if, if he doesn't want to have a tattoo, if he doesn't want to get a tattoo, he shouldn't have to get a tattoo, but they've so internalized this idea that, you know, no, 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 you don't, you don't get individual choice. We are all going to do this same thing. And if you, if you, you know, resist or try to talk your way out of it, we're just going to say, oh, what, you're, you know, you're a baby. You can't do, the, you know, just, yeah. And yeah, um, Xander versus Johnny, just so satisfying when he just smacks him in the face. But Xander does also get some some good, you know, he, he elbows Johnny in the gut a couple of times. And it really is very effective when, like, he flips him over onto the table. You know, just, yeah, you, you feel that. It's like, ugh, that looks painful. And, yeah, so the first, you know, the, the officer says, we're part of the first wave. Which, you know, we, the viewer, realize not long after this scene, they're basically just, like, human shields. They're, they're cannon fodder. But he says, that means more bugs for us to kill. Which, you know, they always manage to find a way to angle it. You know, more bugs for us to kill because there hasn't been anybody there to attack yet. We might get overwhelmed. It's more for us to do, you know, just, yeah. And the drop is legitimately very intense. And yeah, we you know, as soon as they land, the bugs start killing mobile infantry on K. And I I really love that like the big moment where Johnny shows he's a leader. You know, Ace is the the squad yeah, squad leader right now. You know, and they're like, okay, what are we gonna do? And Ace is like, I don't know, I don't know. And Johnny's brilliant idea. I know this. I this is my moment. Kill them all. <laughs> I believe he got that from Sun Tzu. That is that is fantastic military strategy right there. Like just yeah. And yeah, we see that the press sticks around as the mobile infantry are in retreat. You know, they get the order from upstairs to retreat. And they're, you know, they're like, okay, so behind me you see a lot of mobile infantry retreating. I guess I, I'm too stupid to realize that they're supposed to be protecting me, so if they're running, maybe I should too. As you can see behind me, there will be a lot of death. The forecast says... Oh, I've been stabbed. And let's see. Yeah, and we learn, you know, 100,000 dead in one hour, which right there tells you, okay, this, this was terribly planned, you know. And I really love the, the, I've already talked some in the review itself about the debate, bro. But when he says, a smart bug, have you ever met one? Which is just the stupidest argument against, like, actual science. Like, it reminds me of when Trump got caught with, like, I, what was it again? It was, like, this thing, let's see. Um, let's see. There was this thing about, like, um, yeah, Trump had set up this thing that was supposed to celebrate this thing of, you know, this, this historic event. And someone pointed out, that never happened. And his brilliant defense was, how do you know, were you there? 
just yeah so again you know it's that's the kind of of dumb stuff that's uh, cuz like the thing is we know because of historical accounts like you based on that you could say we don't know anything none of us were there for all of this stuff that we know you know it's such a it, it's like something a, a middle school as offensive to middle schoolers it's something an elementary school student would would use as an excuse Let's see. yeah and we learn 308,000 dead just yeah and and we see a few wounded but you know they note they don't the bugs tend to kill you not just wound you I love when Ace and Dizzy run up to the water tank knock on it and say you're dead isn't that funny because that's the thing you know to them like the idea you know I mean he's he's right in front of us he's clearly alive but this document says that he's dead that doesn't make sense that's funny because if it's not funny it's tragic and they can't the you know they're not in a headspace where they can really cope with that right now you know the the fact because that's the thing like they just they know that 308,000 people are dead and they're like this one's not dead yay you know instead of taking in the horror of all the ones who are dead and Dizzy kisses the glass because Johnny is so great that two girls like him at once and yeah we learned that Zegama Beach isn't there anymore which you know this means that if Johnny had gone there as his parents wanted him to he'd be dead right now you know it's it's this thing that you know conservatives love to say you know you're not going to be safe there if you don't go and fight this meaningless war i really love the reveal that Razjack is this, you know the they they talk you know they really build up oh you know this this new commander is like a real bold buster and someone's get gets hit for saying that he saved my life he saved your life you know and we just see this the the metal arm thing and he walks up and we realize that it's actually him just yeah and I really love that you know in this movie when someone fires a gun it tends to be emotional rather than tactical it feels you know they feel a catharsis it's not that you know this is a situation where a, a you know a bullet will be the 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 thing to really solve this situation it's just you know you're you're threatening me i'm gonna shoot you you attack someone i care about i'm gonna shoot you that person is you know captured and about to you know he's he's going to be brutally killed by the enemy if i don't mercy kill him you know i'm going to shoot it just it's it's that each time i really appreciate that and i i quite like that each time the mobile infantry seems to have things under control you know the only exception is the very very end of the movie other than that each time they seem to have things under control more bugs bigger bugs will appear and the flamethrower bug is legitimately epic like you know it burns that one guy's arm off and you know Johnny shoots it jumps on top hangs on I really appreciate the fact that he does like almost fall off like we see you know he's barely hanging on to the, the top you know takes the grenade down to a you know, massive explosion and yeah Let's see. You're it until I die or I find someone better. I think that's love at first sight. That is that is truly the sweetest thing that anyone has ever said to Johnny. Have fun. That's an order. <laughs> you kill bugs, good. Just love this dialogue. Ah, Busey. No one should have to be that close to a Busey. And I appreciate the detail that Razjack doesn't like, you know, I, I appreciate he can't, like, knock because it's a tent, but he doesn't, like, say, 
Rico, are you, you know, are you decent? You know, for all he knows, he's like changing in there or something. And, you know, he realizes that Dizzy's there and he's like, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And they're like, we can make it, you know, just despite the fact that your superior officer knows for a fact that you two are having sex. And just, and, and yeah, 20 minutes, just, yeah. And... Yeah, the, the base with the, the trap is very clearly I invoking the Alamo. Evoking? The Alamo, something like that. They sucked his brains out. <laughs> I really admire Michael Ironside for being able to say that with a straight face. Just the, you know, intensity and uh, grimace. They sucked his brains out. And, you know, they radio in, and the, the, on the other end, they don't immediately say, oh, I guess, you know, okay, there is something happening there. They just say, no, that can't be. We, we have planet P is clear. If your P is clear, that could be a sign of something, you know. But, but yeah, just, that's a, yeah. And, and the, the, let's see. Right, and I realize this is slightly out of order, but you know, at the start of the film, Johnny is stabbed through the torso in a way that basically it's impossible for him to survive, even with this future medical, you know. But later, when we see the same situation, it's just the leg, and this is, uh, you know, we see how propaganda rewrites history. You know, and, and note, that first bit... That's seen with a camera, a, a neutral observer, at least hypothetically. Later, it's a scene from a movie. So, yeah, you know, the reality was this chaos where Johnny died. But the, you know, I mean, who, who knows that, that Johnny didn't die? His family's already dead. You know, Carmen is told that he's dead, so... Yeah, the idea that, like, if this was based on a real event, the real Johnny Rico did die in this first attack, and then later they rewrote that history to get people, you know, yeah. And I really love the how, how serious they play it. Like, you know, clearly Dizzy is is gonna die, and she knows it. And and you know, she's like she's coughing up blood. She's been stabbed several places. You know, she's got seconds left, and Johnny's like, "No, you're gonna be all right. You're gonna go to a farm, and you can play all day long." Let's see, we have other plans for P. I, honestly, the less I know, the, the happier I am. And, yeah, you know, Carl says, yeah, I got a lot of people killed today. So that makes it okay. The deaths of your squad was just one of many. I have so much blood on my hands. And now we see the, the new troops, you know, and they're, yeah, they're basically children. Which is something that happens in wars that go on for long enough. This was something that, you know, during during World War II, for example, by the end, the Nazis were sending teenagers, children, into, you know, yeah, handing them a gun and saying, the enemy's over there. And, you know, and it's like, and, and Johnny says, we're the old men now, Ace. You're, you're like a few months out from, from like, you're still a teenager yourself. Well, the actor isn't, but, you know, the character is, like, just out of high school. And, yeah, both Carmen and Johnny are told at various, you know, at least once in the movie, that the other is dead or must be dead. And, you know, turns out they survived. You know, very melodramatic you know, American action movie kind of thing. And Johnny goes to rescue Carmen, not to, to save Earth. You know, the, the brain bug was captured by Zim, not Johnny. If not for Zim and his forces, 
the the brain bug would have died on the planet you know so and i i don't think that's the same brain bug i think it's two different <sighs> they say we think there's a brain bug i guess it could be this yeah cuz the the explosion was big and close but again you know fascists rewriting history so yeah and I appreciate the detail that the brain bug is carried by these tiny bugs, so we think, oh, like slaves, you know. I love the the effects as the brain is sucked. You know, the first the the giant thing that comes out, and you know, he spits in his face. You know, someday someone like me is gonna kill your whole fucking race. You know, and the thing goes into his head. Down in and and we see like his eyes turn white and his skin gets like just fantastic. Really love the design. And right, some some killjoy wrote in the IMDb goofs. Actually, that wouldn't happen if his brains is just getting sucked out. Come on, you know it's they're saying they they suck the life out of you. They're you know it's supposed to make them seem more evil than the military commanders who are sending human beings to die. And but you know uh, ultimately there's I, I don't read that much I'm to be goofs anymore uh, so much of it is just killjoy BS like I, th I think that there are things that it can be worthwhile to point out in there but some of it is yeah and yeah, Watkins gets this heroic sacrifice. No American action movie would be complete without it. And I really love the visual as Zim and the others drag the brain bug out of the cave. And the big... let's see... yeah, and, you know... Um, Carmen says, you know, as long as the three of us together, things are gonna be all right. And it's like... <laughs> Just such sappy, ridiculous, like, just, yeah. And it is, of course, also completely absurd that the three from the same class in high school would end up together in the military. Just, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, and the, the thing with, you know, what's it thinking? It's afraid! Yay! <laughs> and yeah then you know now that they have the brain bug we see these scientists stab it with stuff to to you know investigate it you know the kind of thing that you'd maybe like want to do on a, a dead thing or find a way that isn't extremely painful to do on a living thing you know just yeah completely you know and, and sadly there are you know there are some scientists who have, you know, yeah, no ethics and just experiment on the living. It's, uh, yeah. And the, you know, the, the ending said, has the, the propaganda voice saying, you know, we have the technology, we have the, the vessels, and we need soldiers. Because it's perpetual war, and they keep getting so many of them killed. Yeah, you know, what, what are we going to do? Not keep fighting this one, not throw people at the problem until eventually it works, you know. And that is it for this first section. Final section, notes taken while watching. And uh, let's see, yeah, so the... Uh, yeah, in IMDb goofs, I guess I'll just read it, yeah. Factual error. The asteroid would have, have to be traveling through hyperspace to reach Earth in any rational length of time. That would mean that the bugs would have to uh, have had to accelerate its speeds to reach hyperspace and then maintain that velocity until the body reached Earth's atmosphere. Assuming that near relativistic speeds are possible in the Starship Troopers universe, the asteroid should have caused massive damage on Earth far beyond the simple destruction of one major city. Given the size of the asteroid shown in the film, it's likely that all Earth, all life on Earth would have been extinguished either instantaneously or within weeks or months after massive firestorms and the spread 
giant clouds of dust and debris. The odds of a ship physically running into an asteroid launch from Clendathu to Earth are literally astronomical. However, there's no strong evidence it really was launched from Clendathu. This is an assumption the humans make, and it's very absurdity and the early death of the only reporter to question. I don't remember that. Okay, I, um, if you if you know what scene they're talking about, can that... Because it's not... Yeah, I don't. I don't remember that being in the movie, but I could see it. It would. It would definitely work. In the, anyway, is part of the point. Exactly. It's completely ridiculous for it to have been an attack, but human beings, by our nature, tend to read tend to read a will into bad things that happen as a defense mechanism, which has unfortunately led to a lot of unfounded revenge and also a lot of horrible things done to appease gods that obviously do not exist, so that they won't do the bad thing again. Let's see, and right, and the the um, yeah, some some IMDb quotes. Um, yeah, Rashak says, you know, naked force has resolved more conflicts throughout hi history than any other factor. The contrary opinion that violence doesn't solve anything is wishful thinking, and it's worst. People who forget that always die. I'm going to go ahead and guess that he means always die young or always die preventable because, like, we're all going to die eventually. But, yeah, I think that might have been very intentional writing in the in the script. But, yeah, of course a military dictatorship would have that viewpoint. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Let's see. And, yeah, and, and Rashag says, this year we explored the failure of democracy. And, you know, when I hear failure of democracy, like, I think, oh, the, because of the rise of fascism. But no, in this story, according to the self-serving propaganda, you know, fascists do away with democracy because it gets in their way. They hate empathy, which is necessary for democracy. And he says, our social sciences brought our world to the brink of chaos, chaos, which is a myth that fascists used in Germany and that is still being used today. You know, if you... If you listen to a fascist for long enough, which I really don't recommend, it's, you know, you're eventually going to start bleeding out the nose and the ear. You know, if you listen for long enough, they will eventually say, you know, the, the, we are, the, you know, our society is falling apart because of, you know, progress, because of acceptance of the, of degeneracy and, you know, and, right, and, and he goes on to say, we talked about the veterans, how they took control and established the stability that has lasted for generations since. What a positive read of a military coup. Like, they don't even mention, you know, maybe after the military coup, maybe reinstate democracy. Like, even if you think, oh, the social sciences went too far, well, okay, reinstate democracy and just make social science illegal. But no, they maintained... The, this military regime afterwards. And let's see. Yeah, and, and you know, Rashak says, something given has no value. When you vote, you're exercising political authority. You're using force. Force, my friends, is violence, the supreme authority from which all, uh, all other authorities are derived. With that kind of mindset, it's easy to justify actual physical violence because you already took steps in that direction. What are you going to do? not have political authority at all like you know n no modern rule of of yeah you you need some kind of political authority to you know now the let's see the the excellent youtuber anarch recently did a video where he talked about yeah it's called on authority is trash i'm going to link that in the description box because he does such a great job pointing out all the problems with the the thinking that that quote you know describes so yeah right and you know as dizzy is dying she says it's okay because i got to have you because as we all know the one thing that matters to women 
is getting that guy that they like. You know, it's true that there are a number of women who feel that way, but it's often with the goal of having that man's baby. Dying not long after seems more like the kind of thing that a man having impregnated a woman would be okay with, but fascists don't have empathy for women. Let's see. Yeah, and, and you know, at one point, you know, yeah, there's this correspondent Wait, is that supposed to be the correspondent that the the journalist that dies? Oh, you know what? I, but is it the same actor though? I thought it was two different actors playing those. Cause yes, for sure. Like, there's the guy who says, "Hold on, correspondent." Um. Holy crap! It is the same guy. It's, yeah, it's the, the helmet smushes his face together a little. No, yeah. The, you know, someone sent him to the planet knowing that he would die since, you know, the or, or figuring he might die since he was being sent with the first, um, the first wave, you know. So, yeah. Because they didn't like that he expressed, you know, he says, oh, live and let live policy is preferable to war with the bugs. Yeah. Really, really excellent writing. I, I, yeah. But, but yeah, you know, he, so let's see. And yeah, he says, some say the bugs were provoked by the intrusion of humans into their natural habitat. You know, and yeah, Johnny says, let me tell you something. I'm from Buenos Aires and I say, kill them all. You know, I, again. I appreciate there's catharsis there, but emotion is the very worst foundation for war and violence in general. You should not engage in violence because you feel like it, because with that kind of thinking, you know, yeah, like, the... the that's not going to actually solve the problem. It's not going to bring his family back. You know, and yeah, as already discussed, it almost definitely was not the bugs intentionally killing anyone. It was it was an asteroid. It, asteroids hit planets. That happens. Let's see. Yeah, and and um, yeah, the the yeah, Sky Marshal Deans says we must meet this threat with our courage, our valor. You know, because that's, you know, so, so yeah, like, if you're not willing to fight, where's your courage? Where's your valor? Indeed, with our very lives, so yeah, he does acknowledge that people will die, to ensure that human civilization, not insect, dominates this galaxy now and always. How did we get to insects dominating the galaxy? All that supposedly happened was one, albeit devastating, attack by insects, but this is the kind of thing that fascists use. It's just self-defense. Who's against self-defense? You want to lay down and die? The only alternative to lying down and dying is, of course, to dominate the enemy. Yeah, it's just... Yeah, such a... Such solid satire. Yeah, and, and the thing with, you know, young people from all over the globe are joining up to fight for the future... And several say, I'm doing my part, and the last one to say that is a child dressed up as a soldier, and the, the soldiers laugh. And it's like, how are you laughing at the idea of child soldiers? This is something that has quite literally been done. It is horrific. And of course, it's meant to plant the idea in children that it would be good for them to grow up and enlist. The joke is not military service, it's merely that the kid is over-eager and trying to serve. He's not old enough to be cannon fodder yet. Let's see, and... Right, and and the... the thing with, you know, it, yeah, Ace is having difficulty with throwing knives. Sir, I don't understand. Who needs a knife in a nuke fight anyway? All you gotta do is push a button. Sir, cease fire. Put your hand on that wall trooper. Put your hand on that wall! And, you know, he throws the knife and it goes right through. He's like, ah! The enemy cannot push a button if you disable his hand. Medic! 
Obviously, it was completely unnecessary to hurt Ace to make the point, and it's also inherently ridiculous. Like, maybe you think Ace is a jerk for arguing with a superior, but what he's saying makes sense, and that's why the response is violence. You know, he's, he's making sense, and that's not acceptable. Let's see. Right, and and in one of the one of the goofs in the MDB goof section, character error. School teacher Ratchak and a female pupil make pupil make a rhetorical point about Hiroshima having been utterly destroyed, so suggesting that nothing ever there nothing ever lived there again, which is not true. In the novel, this reference was to Carthage, which was completely abandoned for about a hundred years after the Romans sacked it, but Paul Verhoeven changed it to Hiroshima. Due to his political agenda. Political agenda. That really isn't the own you think it is. Like, literally everyone who creates media has a political agenda. And everyone should be against the nuking of two civilian cities as petty revenge for a largely successful military attack of an actual military target. Like, say what you will about Pearl Harbor. It was tactical. It wasn't cruel, which the nukings of Japan were. And let's see, right, and the, um, yeah, so according to IMDb alternate versions, the work print is a pretty final cut of the movie. Some scenes which focus on Carmen's love life have been removed for the theatrical release. In the work print, it is clear that she sleeps with Rico. Yeah, right, the, yeah, as it is, the theatrical cut may really heavily implies it. But after his suppose, supposed death, shares some intimate time with Xander and finally gets back to Rico at the end. These scenes were removed because they caused a lot of animosity towards Carmen during test, test screenings. And this was apparently from both, you know, obviously a lot of men would, would hate her for that. But there's there were apparently also women who, who didn't, you know, and yeah, it kind of seems to me like they just internalized this idea that, you know, I, th I think the exact wording was a woman can't love two men at once, which just isn't true. That's just, you know, that's something that patriarchy conditions us to, to believe. But, but yeah, um, yeah, according to Paul Verhoeven, some viewers asked him to, yeah, to kill the character. But Rico going from Carmen to Dizzy and back to Carmen in the work print did not lead to hate towards him, as far as I've been able to tell. So, yeah, it's the it's the usual thing of you know, a, a woman who has you know sex is seen as as bad. A man who does is celebrated. It is legitimately fascinating that there are people who watched this movie and didn't realize it was a satire, at the very least, when they laid eyes upon Doogie Hitler SS, baby Gestapo officer, like, just, yeah. And I really appreciate that, like, they specifically did cast this child star who, like, I've never seen Doogie Hauser, but as far as I understand, you know, oh, you know, look at this cute kid being a doctor kind of thing, you know, and, oh, by the way, Hitler, Gestapo, kind of, you know, just, yeah. Every major character in this is either depicted as supporting the fascist regime, regime, or if they have any criticism or try to add any nuance to the idea of fighting with bugs, they're made out to be, at best, naive, at worst, cowardly. You know, we see this in the... Yeah, the scientist on TV who brings up the notion of intelligent bugs, the rich parents of Johnny respectively, and the movie ends with it being treated as a victory, that the brain bug is scared, which also subtly notes that, you know, all right, all right so there are smart bugs, without the Fox News type interviewer having to admit he was wrong, despite the fact that it literally got people killed, how wrong his idea was. And after one big military failure, the president is forced to step down, and the new president doesn't appear to even consider the possibility of not considering the military action, because fascism can't imagine permanent military defeat. Even when Carl is callous, the idea that the fascists are bad doesn't seem to cross the minds of our leads. You know, it, by the end, it seems like they've basically forgiven him. You know, it's like, ah, oh, as long as the three of us are together, everything will be all right. You know, even though he earlier said, oh yeah, I've gotten tons of human beings killed. The movie casually drops the fact that the guy who allegedly killed someone is going to get less than one full day of trial. 
and that the execution will be available to the public because fascism requires being the only source trusted for truth. Any longer of a trial would expose people to another perspective and the public execution of course serves to intimidate people in an attempt to avoid people breaking the law. There's no consideration of what the situation was like. Like, obviously murder is wrong, but there are certain circumstances under which you can understand that the person who did it is not purely evil, and if they were, if they were the fascists, if they were, the fascists would be screaming to the skies about how just it is. So, yeah. You know, like, maybe he killed, like, yeah, maybe maybe he killed in order to protect someone else from being killed. After the attack on Buenos Aires, the movie shows an old guy who lost his dog. Fun fact, that's a producer cameo. And he wants revenge. And the fascist TV shows this as if it's a good argument when it's the exact opposite. You should never make a decision like that when you're emotional. This is actually exactly what did end up happening after 9-11. People who were acting on emotion, some of them revenge, some of them greed, sent a lot of soldiers from America and other Western countries to kill and die. Many of whom they, many of those that they killed were civilians in the Middle East, and America has a history of emotional responses to attacks. More examples would be the way they responded to Pearl Harbor with two nukes and the firebombing of civilian targets, and also the way they handled Vietnam. Uh, I think it's possible that this movie has plot holes, but every single IMDb, IMDb goofs entered plot hole is just not a plot hole. Like this, this is one of those that were the victim of people who don't understand that plot hole does not mean I didn't see the scene where or I want everything explained in my movie kind of thing. And yeah, that is it for this one. So yeah, let me know. Are the sequels worth it? Uh, are the games good adaptations of this? Um, do you think the book is better? Do you think there's something... I acknowledge there's... You know, I've heard that, like, in the book they have, like, mech suits, basically, and, you know, basically they were like, we can't do that with this budget and with this technology. Like, today, it, it might be, you know, there are movies where a lot of soldiers have mech suits, so, yeah. And I, I feel like I've heard that at least one of the sequels, movie or TV show, has the, the mech suits. So, yeah, if you've watched them, you know, are they worth watching? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiled thoughts on a movie. I also do one per week talking about my thoughts on the most recent episode of Ahsoka, the most recent episode I've personally gotten around to watching of The Bear. Same thing for Scream Queens. I try to do a daily, it doesn't always work out that way, video talking about the most recent episode I've personally gone around watching of a Marvel TV show, other than Marvel Netflix, which I already did. Uh, currently, let's say, I just finished uh, Season 1 of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I guess later today I'll be doing the first episode of the second season of that. But yeah, you know, I'll be doing also the... the um, hold on, they're called Agent... Carter, um, Inhumans, Cloak and Dagger, Hellstrom, Modoc, Hitmonkey, The Gifted, and Legion. And recently the reviewing thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you're more of this like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. And remember... Citizenship should never require military service. Medic!